But thank you, thank you, thank you. We just appreciate you so much. Jared, we have problems or that's good. Cool. It's up. You, you're the piano man. So. <laughs> so come on. Great to have Max in the house up here. He's got a new job and he's going to be starting earning uh, something from that degree, we hope. Kayla's in the house, Emily's in the house. We just appreciate you so much. Birth God is birthday, in the Emily is in the house. Birthday.
go to the kitchen in Mario was called also. You can go Hallelujah. Um, I just, I feel, it, I mean, the Holy Spirit is just really moving on me. Gary, now do you feel go with him? And what they're praying over it is, if told Scott, he would possibly have to have a pacemaker, um, defibrillator, he needs sh um, shoulder surgery on both shoulders. Both rotator cuffs are torn. And he's he's concerned over his business because he has a CDL license. If you know what balls are excavating is, it's, it's a CDL license and uh, it has to be to operate all that equipment. But he's so discouraged today and, I, and the Holy Spirit is saying, so I want you with me yeah. While they're praying right there right now, we're going to pray over Scott right here. And all of us couldn't go to the kitchen, but uh, I just felt really strong. But I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord right now. And we're going to pray over Scott that everything the devil is trying to steal is done. He, he, his assignment against Scott Bosser is done yeah. in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the authority that we have that you said yes, we ask Lord. in faith believing that all yes, things are Father. possible. So right now... We pray a prayer of faith and believing over Scott because two th over 2,000 years ago, yes. Father, it was done on the cross. The blood was shed. It wasn't spilled out. It wasn't wasted. The, the healing that Scott needs right now in his body, in his mind, Lord, he, he feels like his body is done. But we say that you are just beginning to live in Jesus and your purpose. Scott is not done on this earth, but you have a life to live. You have children to, to teach and to train and, and to, to leave a heritage. Father, we pray over him right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. And listen, this altar is always open. Anyone in this house needs anything, we pray over things, we believe things, we, we, we believe God's word that says healing is for now. Salvation is for now. If you need to find Jesus in your life, this is our altar right here. It might look like a pair of steps, but this is our altar. Your chair is an altar. We just thank God for you right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There's an atmosphere here. And you're creating it.
you were blessed to you know, pastor surprise, or well, the pastor's wife, Jackie, <laughs> with a piano that was brought from their prior, or their former church. And uh, I think she thought she was just going to bring it in here and let it sit and let it be pretty. And I said, no, 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 no. She is a song just to the Lord. Thank you so much. Uh, we love and appreciate her and her ministry and what she does for Jesus in this house. And so uh, I told her, I said, she needs, uh, we want music before, music after, music during. But, but it's when nice. she's, by surprise, she's going to bless you uh, the song and music from the keyboard. We just appreciate her. Give, give her a praise today. She's just special to us. I told her every time she played it, she was up here Wednesday night before Pastor brought the word and she was playing it and I, I get I get teared up and I don't know why. I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit in me that um Neil. Neil. You know the story behind this piano, but just the huh? gift that she has in her. Uh, her regular that mic needs okay. to be used and, and heard. It needs to be heard. And and I know that, that music will uh, soothe the soul. And so I, I'm so thankful for her today. And I'm not sure what she's singing, but that's okay. God does. This week it's an old song. You guys, I think, sang it I have, years ago. I don't think we've sung it since we've been here. It's an older song. But I've just been singing it and singing it and singing it because it is... It ministers to me, and I figure if it ministers to me, there's somebody else out there that will minister to because um, sometimes when we come in into the church building and, and you know there was there's always phrases in particular in songs that stand out to me I mean I like complete songs but but there were songs like the trumpet when it says um, you know love the, the light. ain't no grave when they spoke about the trumpet I thought you know so many people just equate that with a future event, but but the trumpet of the Lord is his, I, you don't have to agree with me on this or not, but I think it's his voice in us. Yeah. Because if it hadn't been for someone else blowing the trumpet of the Lord, I wouldn't be where I am. Right. I wouldn't right. be saved. If there hadn't been someone spoke something into your life somewhere along the line, and, and you know, I, I real quick tried to look some scriptures up, because I always like to share a scripture I, I, when I typed in trumpet in the Old Testament it's so much of it is in is in Joshua and where they, they marched around Jericho I think this is a little fall off here <laughs> when they marched around Jericho they blew the, the trumpet yeah, yeah, they sure and and they shouted and they sang and they praised and, and I thought you know that's what we need to be doing yeah, more yeah. <clears throat> My, this thing is the mic from falling over. A screwdriver or something. But oh well, we'll see if we can make it work. But this, this song has been on my mind all week. And it's called Come As You Are. And so many of us, when we start considering or contemplating coming to the Lord, you know, how many times have we all heard, well, I've got to get some things straightened out before I can come to God. That's not the way it works. In the second, I'll probably sing the second verse twice in this because it's the one that, that speaks to me the most. <laughs> He's not mad at you. Hallelujah. He's not disappointed. His grace is greater still. For your 
voice that whispers you're unworthy. Hear the sound of love that tells a different story. Thank you. 
Clear? Yeah, well, it is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Go ahead and give the Lord another hand clap. Glad to see you today. My intention today was just to wear this marvelous tuxedo shirt for breakfast. But I had Mr. Bailey looked at it and he said, hey, are you preaching in that today? And I said, well, it depends on how much breakfast I get on it. And so as the story goes, as the kids are leaving here, uh, I didn't get enough breakfast on it to embarrass myself to wear it. So. so there you have it. That's the story. And I brought an extra shirt and just decided to roll with this today because it's about time for you camp anyway. So, yeah. Uh, praise God. Praise God. We're uh, so grateful for all of the... All of the fine vittles we had today, if I can borrow a Beverly Hillbillies term. We had some marvel, had a great breakfast. Thank you to uh, the Balsers and the kitchen staff for all that they did today to feed us so well and treat us so well. Uh, we we're grateful for that. And uh, we're glad you're here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so we're. Uh, We've been the last few weeks talking about Pentecost. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Pentecost Sunday has officially come and gone, but Pentecost is so, is such a, it's, it's, there's so much to what it means in the New Covenant that uh, it just takes longer, and some of us takes even longer to get through because, we just look at so many things there, but we've, we've even had to incorporate, just think how many more Sundays you would have to endure this if I hadn't decided to use a couple of Wednesday nights to help do some stuff. But last Wednesday we talked about Pentecost is the kind of coincides, if you will, with the wheat harvest, and so we talked about those things Wednesday night. So I, I will probably mention some of that in passing today if I get far enough along. But if you're interested in how that works and how that all fits together, then I would uh, recommend that you go to uh, either our YouTube channel or our uh, um, Facebook page. It should be posted from last Wednesday night so you can get caught up and get spooled up on, on how all this stuff comes together. But Because uh, typically, I said this last week, so I may, I may open with this, but typically... Uh, the uh, you start talking about Pentecost that it immediately becomes this I won't say argument but it can escalate to that for people it's all about becomes more about speaking in tongues or are you for it or against it and uh, and Pentecost is just a lot bigger than that I, you know I mean that's obviously it's part of it and it's part of the the uh, initial thing we'll talk about some of that. Uh, but it's also still a viable part uh, of, uh, of the Pentecostal experience, we'll say. Uh, I'm going to stop shy of saying it's the only evidence of that experience, because I believe that there's another gift that fits in there properly as well, and that's called prophecy. So we'll talk about maybe some of that again if I get far enough today. Uh, but uh, we started this off talking about, the, about Sinai, about the original Pentecost. We drew the comparisons between how the things that happened there and, and how it translates now and the kind of the contrast and comparison there. Uh, and so I'm going to borrow a part of a title from uh, William Faulkner, who's probably very rarely quoted in church, uh, but he wrote a book called The Sound and the Fury. And uh, uh, the, so I love that phrase. I love that term because if there's anything that describes the original Pentecost on Mount Sinai, 50 days after the Passover, it's the sound and fury. It's the great sound of trumpets. It's the great sound of the great noise of the presence of God and the fire and the fury that had everybody scared. Uh, so, uh, what was it? Moses said, so terrible was the sight that I exceedingly fear and tremble. 
right? So even Moses, who had to walk up into that, who had to move higher to go into that, was not exactly comfortable with all that was transpiring around him. It was still an intimidating uh, presence in that moment. And so, you know, we talked about that. And of course, the great comparison, uh, I think, is my first, hey, Gabe, is my first scripture, Hebrews 12. Yes. Okay, go ahead and put that up there. Seems like I can't get away from this chapter, right? If you've been around on Wednesdays and, uh, you know, we were doing some of this stuff and uh, there's just so much in this. Uh, if you are ever in the mood to compare old new covenant contrast, compare whether it's the priesthood, whether it's the sacrifices, whether it's the, the, the manner in which it works and the manner in which it functions, how God functions in relationship to the world now as opposed to how it used to be, then you need to read the book of Hebrews. And I encourage you to read that. I encourage you to get in there and follow through on some stuff. But, but this tells us, as, as the writer here is winding down his, not his argument, but his discourse, so to understand this book was written, uh, I believe Paul wrote it. It's not necessarily in scholars disagree uh, on the authorship specifically of, of this book. Uh, I believe Paul wrote it because he had so much of that kind of knowledge and that kind of ability to communicate it. Uh, I think that, that you know, the, the, the detractors say, well, it's, uh, you know, it's not in the Pauline style. And he was not writing to the Romans or the Corinthians or to the Thessalonians or the Colossians or the Galatians. Uh, you know, he wasn't writing to those groups. He was writing to Jewish people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were beginning to waver. They were beginning to question that particular moment, that particular uh, uh, circumstance of where they were. It was a, uh, the whole book is written to confirm their faith in Christ as Jewish believers. And so it's important, I think, for us to understand that that's one of the keys to interpreting the book correctly or properly, I should say, gives us a, at least more of a fighting chance in the right spirit. But he starts off here with a contrast of comparison and he says, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Roll on, please. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice that they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Keep rolling for me. For they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. Let's stop here for just a sec. Well, let's go one more. I think it was a, so terrible was the sight. I quoted this earlier, so I want to make sure that you understand that this is the context that I was using in that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. I exceedingly fear and tremble. It makes me, gives him the shivers, if you will. So it's clear to me that what the writer is he's drawing on is the understanding of his Jewish audience in how he's communicating this and he says you're not come to that mountain anymore that's not our mountain and I know we have folks that want to bring us to that mountain and try to circle us back to that mountain but I'm going to tell you that this Pentecost that we celebrate that we are part and parcel of it was that that mountain was the initial and the original and it set the tone and it brought a it set something and established a corner for comparison and contrast and he goes on to say verse 22 but you are come you see you're not coming to the mountain that burned with fire and blackness that's the, that's the sound and the fury we were talking about right the very thing that, that was so intimidating and so overwhelming and so alarming and so, so difficult for the, the, the Jewish people to wrangle and come to terms with. It was a feast of the giving of the law. It's where Moses got the law and where he presented it to, uh, to the community. And, and, and that's where the idea of what it means to serve God according to the law was in, initiated and established in that. But... The writer here says, but you are come unto Mount Zion. You're not come to that former mountain. So that tells me that I can learn from that, but I need to see myself in a different stage, in a different covenant, in a different relationship, in a different expression, okay? He says, you're not, but you are come to Mount Zion. You're come to Mount Zion. It's marvelous to think about this for a minute because Zion is a, 
It is, I believe, one of the highest, it's, in fact, it may be the highest peak that surrounds Jerusalem. Jerusalem is kind of was kind of nested in a in a in a mountain range. And so Zion was the highest peak. It was the most recognizable and the easiest to see. Whereas the initial Pentecost was done in a on a mountain in the wilderness, or excuse me, in the in the in the Sinai Desert. Now we're now we're talking about a mountain that shines over, a mountain that stands tall, a mountain that 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 looks over, if you will, the entire city and body and the very, or we would say perhaps even use the word corpus to describe this, but the of what Judaism had become and where it had seated itself and where it had become this marvelous, this this great entity in the old world because we're still talking old world here, okay. It's not the Jerusalem that you could fly to and see this time because it's not going to look anything like it did at that time, just so you know, all right? But he says, you're coming to Mount Zion. So Zion is not just the highest peak there or a literal place. It's also the place where the king is enthroned. So, so as a figurative place, we come to a mountain where the kingship and the lordship of Jesus has been enthroned, where he has, where he has been seated in authority in our life. That's the mountain you and I are come to. And that's powerful and important to remember because what it does is it positions us under his authority. It positions us for him to speak into our life. It positions us for him to guide us, to lead us, to direct us, to move upon us and move among us and bring us into a, a relationship that is built not on a performance, but on not on our performance, but on his performance. That's called grace. Yes, yes. Anyway, he says, but you are come to Mount Zion. What else you come to? The city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem. So our Jerusalem is not the one that we look at today and people want to quarrel about. People want to, want to pay attention to. The city you and I are looking for is the heavenly Jerusalem. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's a place of, uh, of, of beauty. It's a place where Jesus is Lord. Yes, right? I say, well, he's Lord of all, of all, right? True, he is. Yeah. But there are some places he's more Lord than others. Yeah. Yeah. What do I mean by that? We well, have folks in your family. I know I have them in my family. Yeah. Where his lordship is not exactly well known. <laughs> or where his power and his presence and his direction and his, and his influence is not as prominent, perhaps, as, as we would like to think. Okay? And so this is about us finding and discovering and having a heavenly mindset, having a, a kingdom mentality, if you will. That's why the, the first trumpet, if you will, that you hear, we talked about when the trumpet sounds, I'm going to get up out of the ground. There's a, there's a marvelous idea to this that what happens when you hear the gospel is, is it raises you up to a new life. It's the sound of life. It's the sound of peace. It's the sound of joy. It's the sound of everything that's beneficial and blessed. And you find yourself in a position where God in his authority and in his control through his son says to you and I, you're accepted in the son of my love. Yes, amen. And when you discover that and when that becomes real to you, when it becomes rhema to you, when it becomes powerful in your life and the, uh, 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 the influence that directs and affects how you live, think, and move in the world, yes, then you find yourself operating in a kingdom, in his kingdom. Yes. All right? Anyhow, to an innumerable company of angels, let's roll through this real quick before we get into Acts 2, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So not only is it Mount Zion, not only is it a heavenly Jerusalem and not, a, not a, an earthly Jerusalem, not only is it these things, in the midst of all this, I believe we're talking about the same thing. They're just different descriptive terms, different metaphors, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, figures of speech to say the same thing. And so he says, but to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. One more verse and we'll be done with this for today. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. 
and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The blood of Jesus speaks better things to us, always. The blood of Jesus moves us in a positive direction. The blood of Jesus helps us see heavenly things. The sacrifice of Calvary has, has been offered and given to bring us into a covenantal relationship that moves us in, into his grace and into his kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We also talked about uh, Pentecost, if you will, as a relationship of marriage. Talked about that from the Jewish traditions and the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, kind of the oral traditions of the of the of the feast and some of those things that I talk about. I don't know that I've said this out loud, so I want to go ahead and do this today. Uh, they're not things that I have uh, developed on my own. Uh, I, a lot of that information, when it talks about feasts and talks about the the, the stuff that's extra biblical. My point of reference is I have a book called The Seven Festivals of the Messiah written by uh, Edward Chumney, and he has a lot of this stuff broken down in there, and it, it explains a lot. Uh, so I, that is one of my go-to sources to renew my understanding in some of this stuff. That book is out of print. So if you were to try to find it, you're probably going to find a used copy and pay a whole lot for it. That's up to you. It's your money, and you do what you need to or want to. Uh, but that's my source material for a lot of the Jewish tradition and a lot of the, the background information that is, uh, that's not necessarily spelled out in Scripture. Okay? I want to make sure I get that said. But anyway, the, the idea of it being a marriage has to do with how Exodus 19 talks about them being at the nether part of the mount, which means it was an outcropping and the people kind of stood back under it. And it provided a shelter or a canopy or what's called in Hebrew a kahupa or we would say chupa if you're using, uh, uh, you know, uh, English phonetics. We would say we would give it a ch sound that it's a kahupa. Uh, in Hebrew, their phonetics is a little different. So some of that stuff is kind of kind of tough for us to, to uh, get comfortable with because we're used to saying it our way. Anyway. That that's the place where a, where a marriage is is formalized. It's a place where the vows are taken. Uh, the written contract is called a ketubah. Again, this all comes from author Edward Chumney and the and the Seven Festivals of the Messiah book. And that the Law of Moses was the was the written contract between uh, Israel of God and Israel, and so it became that binding agreement of marriage. Uh, now in the New Covenant, we're going to see that the working of the Holy Spirit is writing stuff on the tables of our heart and on our mind. So what God is doing is he's writing. The, the contract is internal. The contract is, is something that is written and, and indelibly uh, imparted to us by the power and the agency of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's one of those powerful things about Pentecost that often gets overlooked. And so there's, uh, there's some other stuff in that. The, the voice of uh, mirth, I think Jeremiah talks about the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. Voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride uh, being, being lost in the captivity of Babylon and yet being restored. And so John the Baptist refers to Christ as the bridegroom, right? So he's, it's his voice that brings joy. It's the sound of his voice. Let me say it to you this way. He's the trumpet of jubilee. The sound of his voice, the presentation of his gospel, is the trumpet that sounds jubilee in the land. That says salvation has come. That says let freedom ring. Let men find their place and find their free place in the mercy and goodness and greatness of God. Yes, Hallelujah. So there's all of this kind of fits in there. And yeah, I'm trying to get caught up here. So let's go to, let's just jump over to Hebrews chapter 2. So let me do this while I'm thinking about it. Chapter 2. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 2. I said Hebrews, didn't I? Yeah. Good catch. <laughs> At least one of us is paying attention. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the wrong thing. I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. And we don't have that up here to put up here for you. 
And before I do that, let me say, if you've been on YouTube or you've been on Facebook, you have seen, you have seen, and probably multiple sources have come out and, with great warnings about the Passion Translation. And, and the warnings all involve the fact that it's translated, it's a, it's a paraphrase, if you will, or a translation by a single individual. And he's not prone to the, the, the uh, frightening part of it for most folks that are more in the fundamentalist camp is the idea that there's not a committee, there's not a body of, uh, of influence that says this is, uh, that we need to maybe temper this, this is not, you know, this is, you're talking with one guy. So really what you're doing is this is kind of like you're listening to him give his take on stuff, okay? And I think if you do that and you have enough biblical knowledge or you are using other translations, I don't see the fear-mongering about it that I think it gets, all right? Is it that I see to be out there on YouTube and on certain things like that. There's some of that stuff out there that I think maybe uh, if it's the only thing you ever read, I think you might get out of balance on some stuff. I'm going to say that out loud. But if it's not the only thing you read, but I'm going to say this out loud. If King James is the only version you ever read, you might get a little out of balance there too. So I'm just saying, right? And boy, I'd like to say some other stuff, but I better behave. <laughs> Which, as you know, is not easy for me. Anyway, um, this is the, 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 the Acts chapter 2 starts like this. Okay, so let's, again, let's set the stage. Background's important. Jesus has told them to tarry, to wait in Jerusalem because the promise that John gave about the baptized, baptism with the Holy Spirit is about to be offered to them. That promise is going to become a reality for them. Now, I don't know that they know it's going to happen on Pentecost, but it's the next feast, and they've already seen a big shift in how Passover was done, right? Because all of the Passovers before were pointing them to that one where Jesus would give himself as the Lamb of God. Yeah. All of the lambs slain for all of the ages and generations that were, that were done prior to Jesus going to Calvary were all alluding to, were all prophesying, were all speaking toward that one Passover that would be the pivotal point of human history. Yeah. Okay? So it's not a stretch of the imagination for us to consider that maybe there's going to be a shift of some stuff 50 days later as well. Okay? So there's, a, there's about to be another shift. And, and while you're still coming to terms, no doubt, with the shift they just experienced... That they had to, it took them uh, 40 days of Jesus teaching them after his resurrection for them to start to really settle into the new. Now they're going to take another giant leap forward. They're going to take another, another great stride or step into what it means to have the gospel incorporated and brought forth in its new context. And when I say new, it means that just Jesus as a, as a, individual human being is not going to be here to convey it. Now it's going to fall into their hands. Now it's going to be each of them telling the gospel, speaking the gospel, declaring the word of God and the works of God, right? It's going to become, it's going to become their domain. Yes, yes. It's still his domain because he's ruling and reigning in them. And I'm, I'm not, I don't want to take away from that, but for all intents and purposes, they're the face. They're the sound. It's going to be the sound of their voice they hear. It's not going to be Jesus' voice. It's going to be their voice. And they're going to have to discern and recognize and hear the glory of God in what they say. So, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That means when they counted to 50. Literally, it means when they got, when they got to day 50 after the Passover, the day of Pentecost was fully here. So what I want to do is I want to look at it a little different. I think the Passion Translation gives us that. And it says this, on the day Pentecost was being fulfilled. Now, you can look at that from just a 50-day vantage point, if you will. But if there was a shift of paradigm or a shift of of emphasis from the old into the new, then there's something else happening that's being fulfilled also. 
If you're moving from what was engraved on stone at the original on Mount Sinai to what's now going to be written on the hearts of men, you're stepping into a whole new dynamic of how this works. Okay? So, so the, the, the contract between God and man is going to be written differently, and it's going, to be, it's going to function differently. It's going to be a lot more personal. It's going to be a lot more, uh, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a lot more uh, intimate, we'll say. Okay? On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. So... Think of this as Mount Zion. Think of this as their welcome to Zion. They're used to thinking about Sinai. They're used to thinking about what happened when Pentecost came. It's a day to remember. It's a day to think back. It's a day of reflection, right? Just like Passover was a day of reflection for what happened to them coming out of Egypt. But now when Jesus died, it gave those believers something solid to step on, to stand on, excuse me, and to think presently and think forward in relationship to what God had done and what God had set in motion now. So they are getting ready to shift from a just a remembrance of Sinai to a Mount Zion experience, right? Because this is the mountain they're coming to. Why is that? Because the church is going to be revealed. The church is going to step forward. She is going to make her voice heard. She is the voice of the bride. We've heard the voice of the bridegroom for three and a half years. And now it's time for the voice of the bride to begin to be heard in the land. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's where the that's where the idea of it being a marriage comes into comes into merger, if you will, with the with from a, a an echo or a shadow in the old that now becomes visible and openly viewable in the new. Okay, it says uh, you know suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Where did the sound come from? Heaven. Remember what the first one was, was sound and fury, right? It sounded like it was, it was all these trumpets and all this wind and all this noise and all this intimidating shaking and fire and all of these things became so very, very real to them. And it was intimidating and it was frightening and it was, it, it caused them to step back and say, Moses, you do it for us. We can't do it. And boy, was that ever prophetically true. Because they spent a lifetime not being able to do it, not being able to keep the covenant, not being able to follow through on it. They had seasons where they did okay, and then they had those other seasons where they were a train wreck before they ever knew what a train was, right? Anyway, the Passion Translation says, suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind. Now, that has a footnote on it in this, and it says the Aramaic... Because what this guy does in the Passion Translation is he doesn't just take the Greek. He doesn't just take the Greek and the Hebrew. He brings the Aramaic dialogue, which is the language of the day, and how they would say it in Aramaic. And he brings that in there. That's part of what, that's part of the reason it's met with some skepticism by folks that are hard lined with it's either Greek or Hebrew. And there's a certain amount of that that's understandable. And then there's a certain amount of it that says... You know, nobody ever says things exactly the same way. But in the Aramaic, it can be translated like the roar of a groaning spirit. Okay? This is, that's interesting. You say, well, why would, it, why would the Aramaic say that? Well, you think about how Paul will later write about how the spirit works in our life. And he makes intercession for us with groanings, yes. which can't be uttered, Right? So there's this, so there's this, there's a little bit of a connection if you start to think, because we have the, we have the good fortune or the blessed position, if you will, to look back and we can, we can see where it started and we can see how it developed and we can see where the terms might, might add a, a, a layer of agreement with something that, that we would see. Okay. So 
Paul, Paul talks about the, the, the intercession of the Holy Spirit in our prayer life with groanings that can't be uttered. Where we can't say it, there's this groan, there's this, this groaning spirit, if you will. And so the Aramaic says the sound they started to hear was a sound. It was the Holy Spirit groaning. It was God moving into the neighborhood. Not necessarily vacating heaven to come here, but to give himself, to uh, push himself, if you will, to bring himself to fruition and bring him into full manifestation through the body that was going to be called now the body of Christ, through the bride. Yes. Okay? So they, there's this sound that sounds, that sounds like a groaning spirit or a violent rushing of wind. And it flows into the house. And so I want to deal with this for a minute because we have the idea based on songs and based on tradition that all this happens in the upper room, right? You know, the song says they were in the upper chamber. They were all in one accord. That's why I don't sing. In case you were wondering. Anyway. But, no, but later on, I don't know that I'll get to this, but think about this for a minute. What time of day is it when this happens? It's the third hour of the day. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means it's 9 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock in the morning is prayer time in the temple. So I would submit to you that as you see this unfold and you see the multitudes and the masses that begin to come together here, that we're not just trying to see a bunch of people crowd into a, into a stairway to come up into uh, and see what's happening in the upper chamber. I think what transpired in the upper chamber was all the preparatory work, was all them getting themselves sorted out and positioned so that when they went to temple for their prayer time and the ladies were in, the, in their part of the temple or in the outer court and the men were in the, in the sanctuary part of the, of the men's element of it because all that was... Divided very strictly and very, very appropriately by Jewish custom and tradition that, that what happens here is, is the sound they hear in the house is in the temple and it starts to work something that translates and captures the attention of the entire city. Why do I say that? Well, Pentecost is a pilgrim feast and you have travelers. You have people who have traveled to be at the temple on the day of Pentecost to celebrate their feast and their festival of the giving of the law. They've been, they're there to uh, uh, celebrate the wheat harvest. They're there to uh, uh, remember what God did for their ancestors back in the day. And so all of this fits into a, 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 a better, I think, a better uh, uh, understanding uh, or context, if you will, to understand it. So anyway... It rushes into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. So there's this powerful gale force, this powerful movement, this, this air, air movement and pressure. You ever been outside when the, when the air, when the wind's been blowing hard? Sometimes it blows so hard it makes you uncomfortable being outside, right? Particularly if you're at our house. We didn't have any wind. We had a tree fall down last night. But, you know, you get trees and, they, you know, they, they, they become affected by those things. Anyway, that's a side issue. Nothing I had to clean up this morning, so I'm a happy man. Anyway, look, next verse, please. It filled all the house where they were sitting. So they're all in this place, this house. And I believe the house that's referenced there, I believe it is the temple. All right? Now, again, that's if you want to walk into that, be in this little room up in the up, up in an apartment complex or whatever that where, uh, that, you know, where they had the uh, Last Supper and stuff, I, I'm, that's your problem. You can do that. But it makes more sense to me because that's going to have a smaller manifestation that if they're in the house where everybody's migrating to to start with. How much more attention is it going to garner? How much more How much more attraction is there going to be in the presentation of all this if he does it in a little, in, in a little uh, a living room in somebody's house or whether he does it in a setting that's pretty big? Okay? So think about it. 
Don't necessarily have to decide that today. Next verse, please. We're in verse 3, I think. Now, here's where you get a little bit of, uh, it says, uh, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. This is, this is interesting to me. Because here's how the Passion Translation says it. Now, this is all in italics, which tells you that this is his particular perception of it. And here's how he says, Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. Okay? You say, well, that's not what it says. You're right, it's not. But he goes on to say, It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed or rested over them. And this is interesting. It says, sat upon each of them. So think about this for a minute. That the pillar of fire from the Old Testament that led them to Mount Sinai and the cloudy pillar that, by the way, in case you haven't thought much about it, there's probably not any references for the, for the pillar of fire after Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. Wasn't necessary after that. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I'm not saying it didn't happen. It appeared over the temple. A cloud appeared over the temple. They had Shekinah. They had a great glory. They had some of those things that happened. But so, so what if? With a place where it was last visibly seen, it now shows up on the new. And it shows up in a way that is designed to fragment. It's designed to blow apart. It's designed to manifest itself differently. Not as a single column of fire that is designed to, uh, for a nation to follow. But it becomes cloven tongues. It becomes fragmented. And it sets upon the individual believer. Understand this. Jewish theology and Jewish belief does not hold to individual salvation. Everything was about the nation. Everything was about them as a body, as a people. And so what God is saying here is everything you had and you thought you had as a nation, I'm going to break it apart and I'm going to show it to you on an individual level. I'm going, to, I'm going to make it known to you on an individual basis. I'm going to, that fire, that tongue of fire sets upon it, covers. I think in, in, in the original Greek, I looked this up, it means it hovered over them. Now, that starts to work with me, okay? Why? Because in Genesis 1 and 2, when it tells me that the Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep, it means that it hovered. It brooded. It fluttered. What if this is a new creation? What if God's doing this something brand new? And so he's drawing from the imagery they knew that they knew so well, and he's now making it new. He's now bringing it into, he's, let me say it to you this way if you're a tech person. He's updating the program. And if you're an old foggy, funny nutty like me, you don't like program updates. Because you just got the other one figured out. And then you update, you got to run an update, and you can't find anything, and then you, you know. It's not necessarily as inspiring as we would like to think it is. But think of it in those terms that God updated the image. He updated the programming for what he was doing and how he was moving and interacting in the world. He did that in the life of his son. He had already taken himself who was invisible and he had made himself visible or tangible in the life of his son. And so all that we need to know and all that we can know about him, we find and discover it in Christ. And now that becomes a, a powerful thing, right? Yes. Jesus was, was very moved toward individuals. Yes, he was. Yeah, he preached to multitudes. He did. But he would also move out of his flow to go set by a well in Samaria because there was one woman. Who needed to hear what he had to say. Wow. See, we think sometimes our worldview is we have to, we start thinking of the masses, but, but you know, and it's all right to think about the masses, but you have to have a worldview with a one-on-one -on -one working concept. Because yes. yes. somewhere along the line, we have to connect with individuals. We have to connect with people. Yes. 
real people in real time. People that are hurting, people who are suffering, people who are who are uh, out of the out of the flow of things. It's about recovering. It's about finding the lost sheep. It's about moving out to where someone is not in the flow or in the in, in the course of your life that you can that you're able to take the steps out of the course and flow of your life to go take care or speak to that individual. That's what happened in my estimation on Pentecost. The pillar of fire, if it shows up, it shows up, and then it breaks apart, and it starts to set. It's all over 120 people. It's not just in the court of men. It's in the court of women. There are people in the outer court who are believers, who have a tongue of fire on their head. It is a covering. It is the canopy or the kahupa of relationship where God is communicating himself intimately to these people. And it is so different. It is so out of the ordinary. It is so odd in the moment. (coughs) Praise the Lord. He sat upon him. Just like God in creation took the took the formless deep and he brooded over it and he fluttered over it and he hovered over it. And, and I love that the Hebrew term there means it's through the idea of softening. So that means that he was he was making it pliable, make softening it so that when he spoke about light and life, it could receive the command to respond to it. God's hovering and fluttering over over his house, over his generations, over the the original crew, if you will. And he's fluttering and he's hovering and he's brooding, if you will, over them. And what happens is, is those who are in the deep, those who are in the dark, those who are outside, those who have no understanding are drawn to it. They're captivated by it. They are brought forth and it's, they start to see it and they move toward it. Whereas in the original Pentecost, when they saw the sound and the fury, they moved away and hid. Yeah, yeah. There's the comparison and contrast, right? Yeah. They were drawn to it. It pulled them. It had something, a quality about it that says, come and take a look at this. Come and see. Yeah. How is that? Because the Spirit is saying come the spirit is issuing an invitation to all the pilgrims at the feast come and see what the future holds come and see what is happening when i update this image for you and you can now find your way into a better life blessed and attached to and connected with the messiah I don't have this thing set up to where it's easier for me to get my iPad dark than it is my Kindle. I haven't done those kind of separation and kind of settings. Probably should have done that before I come in here. Anyway, but he's speaking to them. He's drawing them. He's pulling them forward, if you will. And so it's a, it's a powerful thing, right? He's brought them to Zion, and they're not running away. They're being drawn to. Remember, I think it's in Isaiah 28 and 16 where the prophet first says, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, right? It's in Zion that I'm laying my foundation, the stone to build upon. Jesus cites that two different times. He, he talks about that in his dealings with the religious leaders and, and, and Paul and Peter both recite that, that idea of Zion being the cornerstone and Zion is where the cornerstone of everything is that God would build redemptively in the earth. That's why it's, a, it's important. Praise the Lord. It's separated into tongues of fire. It's okay. Verse 4 says, And they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit. 
and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. So it's not like they went to school and learned this. They were just being inspired and moved upon and speaking by the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. You can get into a lot of different facets of, uh, of discourse and even debate about some of that if you wish. But the reason for that, I think, is powerful because, because they've heard the voice of the bridegroom. And it's restored. It's been the sound of jubilee. And, the, and it has brought the restoration of joy and gladness to the land. But there's another voice that needs to be heard. It's the voice of the bride. Yeah. Now, the book of Revelation in chapter 22 finishes with this statement. The spirit and the bride say, come. Yeah. So what the Holy Spirit's doing to draw people in is the invitation. We talked about that. That's the spirit saying, come. That's the spirit beckoning, inviting, and drawing people to come to a, to, to wit, not just to witness, but to participate. To be able to find their way into this new covenant. But the bride is getting ready to speak. And she's getting ready to declare the gospel. This is where her voice is, begins to be heard. Now, so often, and I, 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 I've said this here a couple times, I want to say it again today, not necessarily to distinguish myself from other preachers and other perspectives. Uh, if it does that, it does that. But I believe the church was born when Christ's side was opened on Calvary. I believe that's where she was drawn out, just like Adam. You start looking at those things and start seeing that some of the, the pattern and some of the imagery of the initial uh, uh, bringing forth of the woman out of the, out of the side of the man. And with Jesus, I believe that's why the Roman soldier opened his side after the deep sleep had fallen upon him was to bring out, was to was blood and water to come out was for there to be in the spirit there was a, the birth of the church and a lot of people use Pentecost as the birth of the church I prefer to think of it as her emergence this is where Esther steps forward and puts her hand to the scepter you say all that in three days yeah we're on an accelerated program ladies and gentlemen the corn of wheat went into the ground three days earlier and now the harvest is here right so, so, you know, Jesus referred to himself, John 12 and 24, as the corn of wheat that must be fallen to the ground and die or it abides alone. So now we're looking at the, the incidence of the wheat harvest, and now it starts to play in and factor in. There's a, there's a harvest, as he said to his disciples in, you know, in the fourth chapter, John, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white, ready to be harvested. See, there's a readiness, there's a preparedness, there's God's working in the spirit is different than what we see in the natural. And so he's bringing things on an accelerated program and plan. The new creation project is something that is moving quicker than what we have come to appreciate from the old established way of doing things. Anyway, verse 5 says... <clears throat> now at that time there were Jewish worshipers who had immigrated from many different lands to live in Jerusalem. They came to stay because of the feast. They were what would be called in Greek terms as the diaspora or the dispersion. What is that? That's the Jewish people who did not return to Jerusalem after captivity. But they made their life in Babylon. They made their life in other cities apart from Jerusalem. And what they did was they still continued to walk in the laws and the, and the commandments and went to synagogue. They, helped, they had synagogues built into all of those places. And yet they made the trip or the pilgrimage, if you will, to Jerusalem three times a year as the law commanded them to do. And they would do that and they were there. They were they were Jewish believers from different lands. And so their primary languages were not Hebrew. And see, that's a powerful thing too. Because in the Jewish culture and community, if God had something to say, it was said in Hebrew. It was said in a way that connected them right to the old. But now what God's saying, he's saying in their native tongue. So the bride's voice is destined to be worldwide. It's destined to speak the language the world knows and understands. And it needs to be, sometimes we need to have our approach updated. 
And sometimes it takes some difficult circumstances to get that done. What is the language of the day? Well, the language of the day is technology. The language of the day is, it, it is how, uh, it is uh, video. It's, it's uh, those kind of things. You say, well, you know, TV ministry's been around for years. Yeah, but not everybody's been able to afford it now with an iPhone or, a, or an Android phone with a cell phone or a, or a tablet of some kind and the, the ability to connect online. You can be, you can have, a, you have a platform by which you can speak and address the world. Yeah. It's a different day. Praise God. What does that mean? That means you start speaking the language of the world. And so most of us will recoil. Those are those the, the real strong traditionalists will say, oh, we can't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we have to be in the world but not of the world. Well, you don't have to be of the world to speak the language of the world. You can still declare the praises of God in the tongue they understand. Yeah, One of the things that I'm working on right now is I was listening to a particular discussion by some folks, and they were talking about. That, that young people, it's rare for them to read books anymore. It's rare for young people to read books. They'll watch videos. They'll watch documentaries. So all the more reason for that generation that starts to move away from those things or to move into a different realm to have some capacity to be able to continue and speak the language that they're comfortable with to communicate the gospel to them. Okay? Okay? I'm not saying you should do that at the expense of books and at the expense of everything else, but I do believe that there needs to be, we need to be mindful of how, and uh, what's the best way to touch the next generation, to communicate with the next generation. Yes, yes. I was at, a, 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 at an event not long ago where somebody referred to the, the, the nice old people, the, the, pe the old people that were nice to them. Talk about me and Jackie. <laughs> 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 I'm glad you laughed because it is funny. <laughs> See, what's really cute about this is I remember, I remember when I would go to places and say, how many of you in here are under 30? I get to raise my hand. Right? Yeah. And wow, it was, you know, having you here was something else. Now I'm the old guy. And there's something marvelous about that too. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, I don't necessarily aspire to being forever young. I just, I just simply want to be able for God to glorify himself in my life. That's my, that's my purpose. And, 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 but it was so weird. I thought, wow, I've really come full circle here. We've come from being the, 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 the young, inexperienced preacher, people trying to get you places to get in a pulpit so you get some experience to the old guy that doesn't hardly matter anymore. That's a real thing, by the way. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's a real thing. <laughs> but, but it's... You've been in it long enough, you're going to find yourself, uh, you're, you're not changing teams, but you're on a different element of how the team functions. Yeah, yeah. What am I, I don't need to get into that today, so I need to stay with what I'm doing here because we're about to run out of time. So probably not going to finish today, just so you know. Anyway, verse 5, at that time there were Jewish worshipers who had immigrated from many different lands to live in Jerusalem. All right, verse 6, When the people of the city heard the roaring sound, crowds came running to where it was coming from, stunned over what was happening, because each one could hear the disciples speaking in his or her own language. I love that. Because see, everything about our tradition, everything about how the perception of the church is and the perception of religion is, is that it's a patriarchy. It's all about the guys. And I love the fact that when, when God starts speaking, he ain't just talking to the boys. He's speaking in a way that communicates to everyone in his image. 
In the image of likeness, God created them. Genesis says male and female created he them. I'm not trying to get in a gender argument this morning. What I want to do is I want to tell you that it doesn't, that, that, the, that it's not just a guy thing. It's not just a, 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 a brother club or a man's club. It is a image of God club. And it becomes part and parcel of each and every person, regardless of gender, regardless of social status. The gospel is designed to be heard in every forum and every format that humanity knows and finds itself in, either by choice, by design, or by trap. Yeah, yeah. What do I mean by that? Listen, there's some folks that fell through the grading and fell through the stuff that had no design to be where they are. They don't, and they probably couldn't tell you how they got there. But the gospel can still touch their life. Right? The gospel can still make a difference, but I love the imagery here. They heard it and they came running to it. Original Pentecost, they heard the sound, they heard the noise, they saw the fire, and they pressed back against the mountain and they stayed away from it because it was going to kill them if they weren't careful. These folks are running toward it. These folks are coming to it. The draw of the Holy Spirit, the design of the gospel is to draw all men unto me, he said in John 12. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Powerful sound of his presence is unmistakable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's, I've already talked about God being personal here. And so, and they're bewildered. Verse 7, they said to one another, aren't these all Galileans? Now, so I made this comment recently that evidently the Galilean education system was not widely respected. It was a kind of a backwater. It was out of the way. It was something that was different and, and outside of uh, the... Uh, more prestigious areas of Jewish life and, and perception, right? And, and so Nazareth is part of Galilee. That's why some of the very rulers and chief priests said, can, you know, can any good thing, you know, Philip even said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, right? And they said, you know, check, is out of, out of Galilee? Is that where the prophet comes from? Is that where the Messiah comes from? You know, there's this, you know, there's this dismissive perception of the region, and so this is primarily where Jesus recruits his followers from. Praise the Lord. And so, but so they're speaking in languages that obviously they didn't learn in school. Verse 8. So how is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages? How is it? How do we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? They're hearing people speak, and I'd like to fast forward to the idea that, that what they're hearing is they're hearing them speak the praises of God. They're hearing them declare the glory and majesty of God in their own tongue. So that in itself says that God's opened the gate, if you will, on the way he wants to interact with the world and the way he wants to present himself to the world. That it's not just about the, the old way. Those folks can be included. I want to make sure that's clear. They can come too, but it's not going to flow the same way. It's not going to hold the same parameters. It's not going to be shaped and outlined the, the same. It's a different day. It's a different hour. It's a different motif. It's a different manner in which God is declaring and communicating himself and his heart to the world. Yes, and he takes the simple. He takes the, he takes the folks that you could be dismissive about. And he will take people like that and say mighty things and say praiseworthy things. Let's roll on through this. This is... Uh, Gives you a whole bunch of stuff. We're just going to read this real quick. And I'm going to read it out of the out of the passion. We are northeastern Iranians, northwestern Iranians, Elamites, and those from Mesopotamia, Judea, East Central Turkey, the coastal areas of the Black Sea, Asia, verse 10, North Central Turkey, Southern Turkey, Egypt, Libyans, who are neighbors of Cyrene, uh, visitors from all over the Roman Empire, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Verse 11, 
yet we hear them speaking of God's mighty wonders in our own dialects. We hear this in our own language. God's not just making us all learn Hebrew. He's not making us all say the same thing the same way. He's letting them say it in our language. So he's saying something. Take a message to your people. Hear what you hear and take it home with you. Hallelujah. Just like he did with the young demoniac in Gadarenes who wanted to follow Jesus after he set him free, right? Jesus said, no, you can't come with me. What I want you to do is go home. What I want you to do is go back to your country and you tell them what great things the Lord's done for you. You go back and you keep testifying. You keep telling. You keep living the life that I've given you in front of them and let them see and let them begin to come to terms with my power that is available in your region. So that later when Jesus comes in, they ask Jesus to leave. If you remember the story, they wanted him to leave and depart from the country. When he goes back later, they receive him gladly. Why is that? Because that young man stayed home and testified. His life was a testimony. His new way of living was something grand and great. And it began to bring peace and bring calm and bring stability to, the, to a new idea in their land. And it changed things. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 12. As they all stood there dumbfounded and astonished, saying to one another, What is this phenomenon? Thirteen others poked fun at them and said they're just drunk on new wine. Go ahead to verse 13. So the first question is, what's all this mean? I've been trying to tell you for weeks what it all means. <laughs> so, uh, I'm bow to the Apostle Peter who's able to put all this in just a, a matter of about 20 verses. Probably didn't take him probably didn't take him 20 minutes. Maybe it's taken weeks to do. Well, I'm just not on his level. Okay? Anyway, others mocking. So you have those that genuinely want to know what's happening, what's going on, what's this mean? What's the significance in it? The significance in it is, is that what was, what you've known this feast to be, has now brought you into a new day, has now set forth a new voice. Now it's the voice of the bridegroom, it's the voice of the bride, and the spirit of the bride say, come. The spirit of the bride say, you are included, if you will, and we're going to bring it to your country, we're going to bring it to your language, we're going to declare it in every tongue that can be related to the human family. God has a word for the world. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. That word is Jesus. Hallelujah. Made flesh. Praise the Lord. And for all those who genuinely ask, what does this mean? You have others that want to mock. Kind of reminds me of that parable of the householder, right? Anyway, I won't get into that today. Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. By the way, I had an interesting conversation with a lady years and years ago. Because they were, they were busy debating whether new, new wine was grape juice or not. You know how folks can get. <laughs> Maybe some of you are still there. I don't know. But I was in, I, there was two people having a conversation. I kind of walked in, didn't know what was going on. And I get hit with the question of whether the new wine is grape juice or whether it's fermented. So I know what, no matter what I say, I'm going to make half the room mad at me. <laughs> it's a very comforting thing. And if, you, if I were the kind of guy that worried a whole lot about that, I probably wouldn't answer it. <laughs> but being young and... Well, I mean, just being young <laughs> didn't really matter to me. And so the one person said, well, you know, that's just grape juice. And I said, if that's the case, why on the day of Pentecost did people think that they were drunk on new wine if it was just grape juice? And I love Peter's response. I'm trying to find a place to quit here. Go back up one more. Go back to that. To These are full of new wine. Okay, now you move down. Sorry about that. Peter stands up with the 11. So this is powerful here because Peter stands up 
And when he stands up, the other 11 stand with him. So what they did in the upper chamber as far as filling Judas's bishopric, if you will, with Matthias, when they did this, they had it ready so that when they stood up, they stood up 12 strong. They stood up as, uh, they stood up as the, the apostles of God. And that's how they stood up. And when Peter stood up, the, the other 11 stood up with him. And he lifted up his voice and he says, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Next verse, please. These are not drunken as you suppose. I'm going to stop there for a minute. That was just a comma. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk like you think they're drunk. You think they're full of new wine. You start mocking and saying, oh, these guys had too much to drink. This is how I know that this is the hour, this is the third hour of the day. That's why I said that earlier. Because Peter reveals it to us. Now, I revealed it a lot quicker. I probably should have said spoiler alert. <laughs> okay? But he said, not drunken as you suppose. I mean, they, you know, I mean, they were making fun of what they were doing. And the reality of it was, was that Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 28, I think it's verses 11 and 12. I don't have it right off the top of my head. But he says, for stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And he goes on to say, to whom he said, this is the rest, wherein you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. I think he goes on to say, yet they would not hear. But the reality of it is, is what God was saying. This was a manifestation where God was speaking in an unconventional manner, in an unconventional fashion. And it was done to bring people to rest, bring them to a place of peace, bring them to a place of joy and gladness. It was the restoration of the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Now it's a wedding feast. So let me say it to you this way. Now it's a party. Now it's party. He says, but it's, they're not drunk like you think they're drunk. Why is that? Because it's just the third hour of the day. That's 9 o'clock in the morning. By the way, this is easier for me than military time most of the time. <laughs> just as an aside. Roll me one more, please. Let's see where we are here. Yeah, we'll read a couple more and I'll get you out of there. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter rolled straight into the prophets. He rolled straight into the second chapter of Joel. And he says, this is what, what you're seeing. What meaneth this? I'm going to tell you what it means. It means we're in the last days. It means the last days of what God said he was going to do is upon you. That's what Peter was saying to that audience in that moment. Let's roll on one more. Joel said this. It shall come to pass what? In the last days, Peter was saying to them, you're, what, you're standing on the end of something. But not only are you standing at the end or the close of something, you are standing on the precipice of something new, of something grand, of something great. You're not just here to watch and witness. You're going to witness the end of the old, but it's going to be with a purpose to stride forward into the new, into a new covenant kingdom mentality and relationship that's going to change how God communicates and interacts with the world. It's going to be different. Yeah. It's a new covenant. Jeremiah said, not like the covenant. Not like it was when I took your fathers by the hand and led them out of Egypt. It's a different moment. It's a different way. It's a different manner. But all of those pictures along the way, embrace them. Bring them in and begin to look at them from a new covenant kingdom mentality and mindset. And start finding your footing in fo forward by faith. Yes, that's, right. that's a lot of absence. Find your way forward, footing by faith. Quite the alliterative structure here. Anyway, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This is what you're seeing. You're seeing the outpouring of God's spirit. Hallmark of the last days. Now, I believe some of what they heard was, was in, in the tongue. In the tongues they heard was prophetic. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Right? So not only was it not only was it the tongues that that, that was a, a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, that, but prophecy as well. Yeah. It's that it's that opening of the of the of the heart and the mind to communicate and speak forth and declare the, the greatness and the majesty of God in his in his fullness and in the in the in the power of, of full capacity. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. In 
and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall what? They shall prophesy. They're going to speak. They're going to declare. They're going to prophesy. I'm going to stop here because the, some of those signs and stuff are, are, there's too much detail in that to get into that today. And we'll see whether I want to get into it next week or not. But what I'm after here is that Pentecost is this marvelous redefining of God's interaction with the world. And he says it in so many ways. You're bound to find one of them that really flips your switch, that really, that really meets your heart. And you can find it in a way that allows you to move forward and move forward with peace, move forward with rest, and step into joy, and step into a relationship of life and grace, a relationship of truth and peace. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I give you blessing and I give you praise for this day to day, Father God. I just honor and, and just lift you up and say, Lord God, I pray that your, your presence would encourage each and every heart, each and every one that has sat under the sound of, of my voice today. I pray, Father, for your encouragement and I pray, Father God, for your, for just for your spirit to communicate. And Father, to move upon them and to, and to fill each and every life, Father, with your glory and with your presence. And I pray, Father, for the passion of the Lord and for the goodness of God to, to meet and to, and to fill and to establish, Lord, each and every heart by faith in your redemptive finished work. And Father, I bless you and I honor you. And right now, Lord, in your name, Father God. Speak clearly and speak wonderfully into each and every heart and mind. And let them know, Father, that you are here, that you are present, that you are alive and well. Father God, just cause us to open, let our ears be open to hear the sound of your voice and the sound of joy and gladness in the house of the Lord today. But we will not be quiet. We will. Shout out your name. Yes. In Jesus' name, we give you blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. And amen.